Hey, I'm Sarah Gonzalez. Welcome to the news and why it matters. We have a special guest with us today, Mr. Kevin Williamson. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Kevin is, I feel like an adult has just joined the kiddies table. <laughs> you know? yeah. You're going to have to like it kind of dumb it table. down. Any, yes, it is. Anything and, you uh, say, you're going to have to dumb down. Yeah, to talk us. down to us. So just right, a little I'll, bit. I'll do my best. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Glenn, what's the top story? Um, you know, I've been beating this drum all day, no pun intended, literally, but I've been beating this drum all day, the Covington kids, but there's a new twist now that we'll probably be covering on radio tomorrow, um, and that is the media is not wrong. They're just not as right as they usually are, but they will be right by the end of this, and I'll explain. All right, still. I'm well known for finding the positive in almost anything. Um, oh, yeah. and, you can't uh, find it in this one, can you? <laughs> no, I think I actually have found <laughs> really? a very small sliver of light positive okay. right. in this whole situation. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for being the counter to uh, Mr. Glenn back here. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Well, it's hardly news, but uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, th I got this really weird sense of deja vu just now. Like, uh, almost like that's happened before. Uh, yeah, <laughs> All right. Uh, got a lot to get into. Right. Before we do that, I want to thank our sponsor, American Financing. American Financing is uh, a group of people that uh, tried to get me to advertise with them about 2006 or 2007, and I... You know, at that time, you remember, because all the complaint calls from everybody going, stop it, it's not going to get bad. And I'm like, uh, no, this mm -hmm. banking thing is a total sham with the way they're selling houses. Um, and they called me and they said, hey, would you represent us and be our voice? And I said, not for a million dollars will I do that. And, uh, and they said, why? And I said, A, I don't do any financial stuff because I don't believe in... Uh, the way mortgages are being bought and sold now with the banks. And they said, we're not like that. And I said, uh, yeah, right. That's what Citibank says, too. Um, call me. You know, after the crash, call me and tell me how you're doing. Well, they did. They called me, I think, in December of, of 2008, right after the crash or 2009 or seven, whichever it was, um, right after the crash within two months. And they said, hey, remember us? And I said, yeah, how you doing? They said, we're doing fine. We told you we don't do it that way. These guys, it's local owned business, um, you know, family owned. They've gone national. Uh, they're, they're big now, but they have the same principle, and that is we don't sell mortgages for the purpose of the bank. We don't work for the banks. We work for the client. We don't take commissions or perks from the banks. We go out and we look at all of the loan instruments and we say, this one is right for this person. They like it, they don't like it, that's fine. We make money if we sell it. We don't make money if we don't. We don't need money that badly. These are the people you want to do business with. Yeah. So you can go to AmericanFinancing.net or you can call 800-906-2440 if you still use one of those, you know, what are they called, phones. Did you see, <laughs> have you guys seen the video of the, uh, the rotary phone. The rotary phone. Oh. You sent that to yes, me, right? Yeah. It's hysterical. Have you seen it? Yeah. So funny. I love it. You've got, what, 10 minutes to figure out how to use a rotary phone. Oh my God. To teenagers. Teenagers. It's, teenagers. It's amazing because you don't think, I mean, at least I didn't think about how much technology has really changed in such a short amount of time until I see these teenagers like dialing without picking up the phone, and then yeah. they pick so up the they, phone to clear out the yeah. history for yeah, some they, reason. They dial the number, and then they, like when it doesn't work, they have to pick it up and put it back down to clear out <laughs> the numbers they just put in. It's hysterical. It's really funny. Anyway. All right, Glenn Covington. Okay, so um, today I have spent, all day yesterday, our staff spent working on the Covington to do what is called a TikTok, a minute by minute, here's what happened. And we looked at video from tourists, from the people who were with the black Israelites, uh, from the Native Americans, uh, to see what was happening before the kids from the high school even got there. We documented it, minute by minute, what was going on. Completely different story. Then you see when the first five show up and you see what's happening. So we did all of this to show not only how wrong the press was, but how good these kids actually were, what they were doing was trying to help the Native Americans, um, and you can see it all of, in, throughout all of it. No one reported on the black Israelites, who are despicable human beings in this, um, and we're going to do a special on them tomorrow. Uh, 
And nobody really showed the Native Americans. There were the good guys and there were the bad guys, but mainly good guys, okay, um, that were very, very peaceful. The boys weren't involved in any of it. So we just finished this today. I get off the air and I start looking for stories on the high school. Now the media is going through and they're trying to find anything, anything that anybody from this school has done wrong. It doesn't matter if it happened in 1712. They <laughs> will find it. And it's not because of any other reason other than this. We're not wrong. No, we know. These guys are bad. They are not wrong. They're just not as right as they usually are on this instance. But they'll find it and say, see, we told you, they're bad. It's insanity what is going on. And I, I tell you, it, it, there is nothing more important to me. This is the beginning. Can I say it? Can I say it today? Uh, it's up to you. You wouldn't let me say it. <laughs> Uh, I've heard the theory, so yeah, I know. We, oh, like, we keep talking about it, and, and then say we got to talk about it. Why it matters exclusive? Um, oh. I believe we are now entering the time that I've been looking for, and I oh, it always gave me hope that we are not to the point of beating somebody half to death in the well of the Senate. Okay, that's what happened in the 1850s, mm -hmm. and I thought, okay, well, if that's what happened before a civil war. We're a long way away, I thought, 15 years ago. We're now entering that time. And the only thing that will save us is knowing and standing up for the truth. This one is clear cut. There's not, most times you're like, oh, I don't want to defend that because they also did this. Not this time. This is clear cut. And too many people are remaining silent. The school is still silent. The archdiocese is still silent. The mayor is still silent. Too many Americans are just getting online and they're saying, well, yeah, but look at this and you press, you suck. Don't do any of that. Just speak the truth calmly and rationally. We must stand up for these kids. Yeah. Kevin, I want to get your take on, uh, on the Covington situation. Yeah, um, well, you've seen this and how you've been covered by the press. There's a difference between yeah. journalism and opposition research. Yes. And journalism, when the institutions are challenged in certain ways, switches from doing journalism to doing opposition research. And it no longer becomes about argument, it becomes about indictment. Mm -hmm. About saying, well, you're a bad person, and maybe we got this story wrong, but we'll think of you're a bad person for some other reason. Um, who was telling this, this story that day? I guess it was Dennis Prager was talking about doing a speech on a college campus somewhere, and these people were doing protests, and they're saying he was racist, homophobe, anti-Semite, Really anti-Semite. Uh, Dennis Prager, who's Jewish and has made uh, dealing with anti-Semitism a big part of his, well, okay, well, he's racist and homophobic then. So we'll just stick with that. Mm -hmm. And um, who is that, uh, what's her lady's name? Ruth Graham, who writes for Slate, did this really just embarrassing column today where she was trying to justify her earlier vitriolic uh, denunciation on this subject. And, and her argument was, well, Donald Trump's name is in itself a racist taunt. So, and so is the, uh, and so is the hat. So if you're walking around saying his name or wearing a, a hat that says Trump on it or a shirt that says Trump on it or wearing a Make America Great Again hat, then this is in and of itself a, a racist taunt. <laughs> and then her second line of defense was, and everybody else who looked at the video came to the same conclusion I did. And um, wow. you just want to say, well, that's, that's not how journalism works. <laughs> right. uh, you that's know. not how human beings judge right. lest you be judged by yeah. the same standard. I mean, that's... I, I talked to somebody last night who I thought for a very long time is very, very reasonable. Um, but the hatred of Donald Trump is just growing and growing and growing. And I can understand it. Um, but, you know, you got to look at all of the facts, not just the stupid stuff he says. Is he doing anything good as well? So um, I laid out the whole case and this person said, but why were they wearing the hat? <laughs> what, what are you talking about? I don't know. Why. Well, how did I like Elton John, but why was in some of his concerts he dressed like a duck? I don't know. I don't <laughs> care. I don't care. That's not the point. It's what they were doing. Judged by the content of the character, not the color of the hat. Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, Stu, you said that you have some sort of positive from this? Yes, this does exist in our world very slightly. I thought, um, what better day than when Kevin's visiting us to feature the bravery of the Atlantic in the middle of a crisis. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I, you know, I think one thing we do need to notice, and I think you've made this point many times, Glenn, which is, we hope the media does things and they don't react like uh, Ruth Graham d did, right? You want people to, if they make a mistake, to be able to admit it. And I think so often when that does occasionally happen, conservatives, uh, we do this a lot, we say, see, you, and first of all, you didn't go far enough, you're still wrong, and you're a bastard, and look how wrong you were back then, and you're not part of our group. And it's like, well, I think when this happens, when people actually do take the time to admit that they were wrong, which is difficult, right? Embrace we should them. we should embrace it and we should encourage it. So let me give you a few examples of this. Uh, Julie Irwin Zimmerman uh, from uh, The Atlantic, she says she failed the Covington Catholic test. She writes, if the Covington Catholic incident was a test, it's one I failed along with most others. Will we learn from it? Will we continue to roam social media looking for the next outrage fix? And goes on to say that, you know what, it's, uh, next time a story like this surfaces, I'll try to sit it out until more facts have emerged. I'll remind myself that the truth is sometimes unknowable, and I'll stick to discussing the news with people I know in real life instead of with strangers Excellent. who I've never met. It's a great, a great way of thinking about it. Um, Colin J. Mason uh, wrote on Facebook when this happened, anyone who's surprised by the video of Covington Catholic School Boys is in a state of severe denial about the American right wing and its unholy marriage to the pro-life movement. <laughs> Then he decided to actually look at the video. After posting this, a lot of my friends approached me, insisting there was, there was context that would change my mind. Uh, normally, I'd be skeptical of this, but many people I trusted insisted on this, and they were ready with links to the unedited video. They were absolutely right. That's just not an easy thing for a person not to do. It's one. not. Yeah. I can't, might I just add, just to be the Debbie Downer here. Mm -hmm. I, I knew this was coming from I, you. I find it sad that he had to be armed with someone giving him the link. Like, if you're going to comment about it on social media, you yeah, should think, be okay with Googling yourself and finding it yourself, But I right? think that that's why, I mean, that's why we did all of the homework. Yeah. I mean, not a lot of people have, you know, eight hours. We had we have a team of, what, eight? Mm -hmm. Eight hours yesterday right. times eight. Right, right. So people just don't have that time. No, they don't. They want to see true. an unedited, but they also want to see the cuts yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's no, nothing wrong with saying, hey, look at this. Uh, okay, I will, as long as the unedited is there so they know. Right. Context. I will tell you this from personal experience, and I've never understood this. I was kind of outspoken against Donald Trump. Little I, little I had bit. not noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. Ish. Little Maybe. bit. Yeah. I was a little skeptical of him. Did you write a book about it? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> An ineffective book? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's amazing to me is I said during that time, look, I hope I'm wrong. I don't think I am, but I hope I'm wrong. And if I am, I'll admit it. What's amazing to me is the number of people who even though I said that in advance, and then I followed through on that, and I still am critical on certain things that he does, but I praise him for the things that I think fit in a constitutional and conservative platform, I praise him for that. The number of people that will not accept that, if I'm the average person, I grow to despise you. You, you are not helping anybody come to your cause because you have to be right. That's the problem in America is everything, and I hate to say this comes from Donald Trump, but he is the king of this. It's all about winning. Yeah. No, it's not. It's about reconciling with the truth. Yeah. We were talking about this earlier because the problem is it's not just a crisis of journalism, it's a crisis of citizenship, mm -hmm. which is what makes it so much harder for people to admit error than it was, say, 10 years ago because it is this us and them kind of mentality. So for the first half of my life before I got into opinion journalism, I just I edited regular newspapers. And you run a lot of corrections when you do that because mm -hmm. newspapers make mistakes, as they do. Mm -hmm. And... Our policy is always, you know, correct quickly, correct fully, correct early, because what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. Because you look like an idiot when you try to explain away when you've clearly got something wrong. So the best thing you can do for your own self-respect and for your own institutional credibility is when you get something wrong, admit it quickly, correct it, move on, vow to do better the next time. 
But because we have this you know, culture of, of indictment now instead of a culture of discourse, it's, well, if, you know, if you say it's raining outside, I'm, I don't believe you because you were against Trump. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's, I think, I think the thing that we are, uh, as conservatives, we understand, supposedly, are, is our incentives are important, right? Like, we should be positively incentivizing mm-hmm. people to, when they make mistakes and they call conservatives bad names, don't make them the face of the worst people ever. Well, praise, some, praise them when they come around to the right direction. And I, 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 it would be the same thing for, you'd want, you'd want to be treated if you made a mistake, um, you know, we never get the breaks for those things. We just get trash. And it's like, well, how about instead saying, like, look, maybe that person's come along. We saw that with Kevin Hart, too. Like, the idea with Kevin Hart being thrown off the Oscars for some joke he made 10 years ago. Well, if you want to follow that storyline, let's say you think he was homophobic 10 years ago. Well, now he's agreeing with you fully. If anything, he's come along to your viewpoint. You should be rewarding him. Um, I, I, instead, that just, he just makes you into a bigger... But then it's, you know, the kid who won the Heisman Trophy. And it's, well, you were homophobic, too, 10 years ago. When you were 14 years old. <laughs> right, right, right. But, here's, but here's the reason why I think many conservatives, and like me today on radio, I did not give the New York Times a break. Mm-hmm. I'm not giving CNN a break. No. And, and it's because all they did was say, oh, yeah, you know, there turned out to be more evidence. No, that's, this, not, that's totally different. The this, Times headline was great. Fuller picture emerges. Yeah, fuller. <laughs> right, fuller picture emerges. It's always a passive verb, right. emerges. Yeah, right. Right. Correct. Right. Correct. Really. Why, no, why did you, you write it if you didn't know the full picture? Job. You didn't do your job, and if you, if you don't learn from that mistake, beyond that, they um, still, I mean, I would be, if I was used like the media was used here, but there will, there, they want to be used like this, so yeah. that's not a problem. But if I was used by Nathan Phillips and... I saw the picture. It's one thing to say Nathan Phillips yesterday said Nathan Phillips probably a bad guy, an activist, blah, blah, blah. I think he knew what he was doing. No, 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 no. Now that we've made the case and we have the video and we could track where he was when he came in, that guy is a dangerous liar. And if he would have used me and I found out, like I found out today when we finished the research, uh, if I were the New York Times, I would make it my life goal to expose at least what he did. But they're not. There's they're no not. Yeah. I find particularly contemptible about that is, you know, you, you come across a Paul Begala or someone like that who is, you know, kind of intellectually dishonest. That's his job. He gets paid for it. You know, this guy does it just because he likes to. Yeah, for fun. For fun. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a weird hobby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got to take a break. We'll be back. And it wasn't. If you watch the video, it Before we get back into it, I want to thank our sponsor, Rydia Zone. Uh, so I know probably a lot of you out there, your New Year's resolution just recently was, oh, I need to uh, lose the extra weight that mm, I don't just. Don't know what you're talking about. Mm, you don't? Mm, don't know what you're not saying. Not a clue. Nope, not 50 pounds here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe you're like us at the table. I don't want to speak for Kevin because I would hate to assume anything, Kevin. But the rest of us here at the table have unfortunately hit the age where you're like, I used to be able to eat that and not gain 10 pounds overnight. Yeah. So, uh, wow, if, if only you... 10 pounds. <laughs> huh. Wait till you hit my age. <laughs> Uh, but my, my, my experience is that if you need to add some carbs to your diet, like wild turkey's not the best one. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. Huh. yeah. I just, you know I what? I, I, I need to, this is I what I learned in my that. 40s. I'm going to experiment with that and make sure that you're right <laughs> yeah. before Smart. I take your yeah. word for it. Always yeah. get more evidence. Yes. Smart. That for yourself. Uh, yeah. But seriously, if you have weight to lose or you're just trying to maintain, Ridizone, the folks at Ridizone have taken the good molecule in olive oil that helps boost metabolism and help you feel full, and they stuff it into a capsule so you don't have to uh, just chug bottles of olive oil. I think that's preferable. Yes. So uh, you can go to ridizone.com, get 30% off of a three-pack of bottles. That's a three-month supply with promo code Blaze. That is R-I-D-U-Z-O-N-E.com, promo code the Blaze. Can I just, can I just ask a question? Yeah. When is the medium health medium, or what the hell is that guy? Oh, I think maybe next week. Next yeah. week. Yeah. This guy, he's got a best-selling book out. He's a spiritualist medium that knows about health. My wife was given a book by a <laughs> friend who has MS. It's like, this guy's changed my life. Got to do it. Oh, I want to meet oh, him. This is right down Sarah's alley. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So hook me up. Oh, I'll hook you up. <laughs> 
I will hook you up if he will unhook me because now I'm drinking I'm drinking 16 ounces of stupid celery juice. celery juice guy. By the way, I started looking into that. I think I could get you out of it. Oh. oh, I've looked at some of these studies. That you guys, you <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so quick, but yes, of course. <laughs> All right, Kevin, uh, you said Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said something dumb? Yeah, well, um, she was in a conversation with um, <laughs> Stephen Colbert's, the, you know, de Tocqueville of our time. Can you stop that? Uh, just, he was, she was in <laughs> she a was conversation. She was in a conversation. <laughs> just end the sentence there? Yeah, she was that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, a couple of things. Um, and do, we have the clip if you want to play it. Well, she was talking about uh, activism and how some of the Democrats are saying, you know, tamp it down a little bit, maybe not helping that much, a little too extreme. And making a sort of grotesque comparison between herself and Martin Luther King, she said Ooh. that... Um, <laughs> That's always good on King Day. Yeah, yeah people like always that. good. Like people. in your first week in Congress, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, she said, well, you know, he was really unpopular. He was wildly unpopular, as, as she put it, when he was fighting for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I wonder if that's true. And so I went and looked it up. And it turns out it's not, actually. I mean, he, was, <laughs> he was quite popular at the time, and the Civil Rights Act uh, polled really well, two to one uh, support mm. of it uh, a few months after it was passed. And 78% support for the Voting Rights Act, which came shortly after there. So um, this actually was not the case. Mm. So huh. <laughs> she also was saying that, um, you know, uh, that the world's going to end in 12 years, as she put it. So she's like a, the, the Mayan calendar thing now, but it's, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, global warming instead. So I've done what I always do for people like this, which is, well, let's make a bet on it. Like, if you're really sure that there's going to be some catastrophic global warming episode within 12 years, let's make a bet. And, uh, because if... Because I, I don't have to pay, right? Yeah. <laughs> if the world happens, is over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, um, that's, that's, that's my plan. But um, so uh, to a larger point, though, you know, she belongs to a party that likes to call itself the reality-based community and the you know, party of science and all this stuff. But she said in an mm. earlier interview, she had said this ridiculous thing about how there were trillions of dollars in accounting errors in the Defense Department, which could pay for her socialist health care scheme. And someone said, well, actually, there's not trillions of dollars in accounting errors because there's actually not even trillions of dollars in the budget. It's right. a, a couple hundred million. And she said, well, you know, it's more important to be morally correct than factually or semantically, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think she knows what semantic means. At least that sentence would suggest That's that a, she does. It helps you <laughs> dance, right? You're yeah, a good yeah, right, yeah, you're yeah. semantically inclined. Yeah, so um, <laughs> she is, uh, is not covering herself with, with, with glory. And one of the unfortunate things about the current political and media environment is that you no longer do the thing where you get elected to Congress and then you just kind of sh just keep your head down for a couple of terms until you mm -hmm. sort of learn where things are and, you know, uh, where your parking space is and, you know, where the, where the bathroom where is. Where Mitch McConnell's and, office is. Yeah, where Mitch needed. McConnell's office yeah. is. Or, you know, how a bill becomes a law, which she also apparently doesn't really quite know. And, uh, and those sorts well, of things. Well, she hasn't. She's been looking for the little, the little guy, what's his name, Bill. To sit on a hill, <laughs> yes. That sits on the stairs of Capitol Hill all right. the time, no. and she hasn't talked to him yet. No. He's got a great singing voice. <laughs> <laughs> he does. You know him. Yeah, Schoolhouse Rock. That was yeah, a big right. deal. I, I, the one I remember, there was the thing with the singing wheel of cheese, which I think, <laughs> I think the dairy lobby might have had something to right. do with. <laughs> Conspiracy theories. Conspiracy. Conspiracy theories. It's interesting with Ocasio-Cortez because, uh, first of all, if you're a Democrat, turn this off right now. They keep promoting her like she should be the face of the party. And we say and, yes. And we say, you know, we keep talking about her. They're like, they're obsessed with her because they're afraid of her. No, <laughs> opposite of what you're thinking. Like, I am much more scared of Kamala Harris than I am of Ocasio-Cortez. It Kamala. is Kamala, oh. according to her. And I think she's right on this one. Uh, it's the only thing I know we won't right elect on. her because she has a strange-sounding name. Yeah, I have a yeah. slightly, slightly different take on that. I wrote yeah. a column for the New York Post about this a few weeks ago. That there's, there's some envy involved there, too. Republicans really very much like to have a young, yes. non-white woman who mm -hmm. was as strongly on their side as she is on the other. I that's think that's true. true. I, I, yeah, go ahead. That's true. That's true. Well, sorry, we got to take Not a break. Enough. We'll get more into this in overtime. Harris and her are going to fight for the exact same policies, and Harris is so much. All right, we've only got uh, less than a minute here. Kevin, can you tell everyone where they can find you? Nationalreview.com. All right, and you just have a you have a piece that's up today that's about what? Uh, why the Democrats should dominate Bloomberg in 2020 if really? they were smart, but thankfully they're not, and they won't <laughs> do that. So um, there's and that. He's got a new book coming out this in spring? the summer. Yes, in summer. The summer, and he's just told me about it. It sounds fantastic. Awesome. It's called the smallest minority. You can go pre-order it. Goodness. All right, go pre-order that. And uh, if you have not yet signed up 
Go to blazetv.com right now. Use promo code NEWS and you can get $10 off of your annual subscription. We've got all the big names and we're just getting bigger. And uh, that's it from us. We'll see you guys in overtime.